that we are going to talk about ASCM, what it is. Many of you are members, so you probably already know. Some are not. Uh, brief intro about me. We'll talk about team, high performance team. It might seem trivial, but it's important to level set that before we deep dive into some of the more profound things. And then we'll talk about the framework for high performance teams and certainly how it relates to virtual teams. We'll end with Q&A. So let me start with uh, sort of a shameless plug for ASCM. Uh, ASCM, I encourage every one of you that is not a member to become a professional member, a great organization. I've been involved with them since about three years ago. Great group of people. All the things they do are on the screen. Uh, if you're encouraged, if you're in, interested in becoming a senior leader or on the path to a management track, engineering management is the core of what we do, whether it's CAEM certification or more advanced certified professional certification. We have the annual conference, which I attended a couple of years. Great event, a lot of breakout sessions. Industry leaders are there. Highly recommend people to attend. This year might be a virtual event, but going forward, a lot of learning opportunities like today, volunteering opportunities. We have the MBOC. Long story short, do look up the website, ASEM.org. Look at the membership details and join. I don't think you'll regret it. Um, the next slide is just a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer by profession. Most of what you'll hear today are things that I have struggled with or experienced or seen clients do. So this is not theoretical that uh, what we think might work. These are real stories and nuggets that I hear. Um, so my experience with virtual teams in the corporate career was very less because it was mostly forced to face to face meetings in Michigan. Our team was all of it was there. There was a small team in Nottingham, England. So we worked with them. There was another one in Searcy, Arkansas. We worked with them, but not to the degree that I'm doing now since I started my own work about six, seven years ago. So I then worked with teams, certainly in the continental USA, you know, as far as Hawaii, Denver, West Coast, East Coast, I'm based in Michigan. Uh, teams in Mexico, teams in Europe, Spain, and Italy. So a lot of the things that I've struggled with working with those teams has fed into this presentation today. Uh, the high performance team uh, framework I've used for Society of Automotive Engineering, I lead a session for them since 2013. And in there is this module where we talk about the five behaviors of an effective team. So you'll hear about that. Um, so there's a one day module that it ends in, how do you create a high performance team? It, the focus has not been so much on virtual because this wasn't that big of a deal, but since the beginning of this year, a lot of people are asking us, how do you do this high performance aspect of it in a virtual environment? So that's my background real quick, hoping to share those things with you and hoping to listen from you. So again, you've already uh, played with the annotate button a little bit. Uh, I would like you to and have fun. <laughs> you know, this is, a, this is your session. This is uh, me, is, think of me as a facilitator. I have a few slides, I have some videos, I have things to do. But the, if you don't participate and engage, I think the essence of the session may not be as meaningful. So I request and urge on the session, be engaged, chime in, raise your hand, all of the above. All right, with that, let's dive into this. So my first question, and you can type in the chat box. And if you really want to talk, raise your hand. It may sound a trivial question. What is a team, right? Sounds like a trivial question, but if we, before we go into a high performance team or a virtual team, what really is a team? So you can type in the chat box if that's easier for you, or you can annotate on the screen. What is a team? So we have somebody who wants to talk. So let me unmute them. Jenna. Hi. Hi, Jenna. Uh, hi. I didn't know I was uh, wanting to talk, but um, I would say a team is a group of people working for a to, to achieve a common goal. Awesome. Uh, perfect. Short to the point. Uh, I saw your hand raised, so I assume you wanted to talk. Maybe you were playing with the raise hand button, but regardless, on the spot, you gave a great answer. Yeah, a group of people working towards. So Simon is saying the same on the chat box. And that's critical that there is a common goal. For the purpose of this session, I would say the team is also a smaller group, right? Because we're not talking, it could be a $50 billion company and they can say we are one team 
So you want to you know, be the leader in our market or have profitability. But we're not talking about 40,000 people. What we're saying is if you lead a group and you have direct reports, typically you might have six to eight, right? It's manageable because you're doing performance reviews, you're coaching, mentoring. You can't have 50 people team. So the, for the scope of discussion, maybe at the most 12 people, right? So the team here means a group of people that interact together. They're not working in silos. They are dependent on each other. That one plus one is equal to three. So again, maybe trivial, but important to have that uh, demarcation. Um, the other question I would ask is, what is then a high performance team? If a team means that people are able to um, sort of you know, have a common goal and work together, what is the meaning of a high performance team? I think that's my, my next question for you. Yeah, so somebody says, Jeff Bezos says, number of people working on a project that can be satisfied with the two pizza dinner. <laughs> so yeah, that's kind of the idea that for the scope of this discussion, um, that's what we're talking about. In terms of high performance, then we should think of high performance. What does that mean? Like if the team is doing its job, is it a high performance or what is so special about? So somebody said, Tress said meets or exceeds expectations. Other comments? What does a high performance team mean? Get to the goals in an efficient way. That's ahad. Jenna says, gets the job done with minimal resources, minimal time, great responses. There's some idea of efficiency. There's idea of minimal resources, right? So high performance is not just necessarily getting the job done with overtime or other challenges. I have two interesting takes on it. One is that if you've seen a high performance team or led one or be a part of one, it becomes a magnet, right? In an organization, people start talking about it, whether it's a functional group or a project team, people wanna be on that team. I don't know if you've seen that or not, that high performance team becomes a magnet for good things in the rest of the organization. And the other trait of high performance team is that it's not dependent on one individual that people can be on vacation or sick, or maybe even leave the team. The dynamics of the team does not change, that it's not dependent on, it's a high performance team because that level of interdependence and maybe the cross-functional training in the team is enabling them to succeed. Uh, cohesiveness is, a str is strong, in other words, Saurabh is saying high performance would be people who can cover for each other, so that's kind of the same concept, that if somebody leaves, the team doesn't fall apart. Rajat is saying people performing to the best of their abilities, which is more individual, but also leveraging someone else's strength. So there is that idea. Um, another example that I've successfully used in the SAE session is a parallel with, uh, you know, if I asked you, what is your job? Each one of you on the line, if you can type in, what is your job? What do you do? What would you say? Let's hear some responses. So you can, again, annotate. Maybe it's diff difficult to annotate. You can type in the chat box. That's fine too. Everybody can see it. So what is your job? What, is, what do you do? Anyone can go. Uh, lead capital expansion projects from concept to completion within deadline. Okay. Others? That's Rajat. CI engineering manager, Tress. ASEM operations director, serve ASEM members. Jenna, facilitate process for my students to get the finest education. Other responses, what is your job? What do you do? Cheerleader of the department, department chair, that's a hard. <laughs> so it's not a trick question. Uh, and, and this is, the answers are great that whether it's a title or it's some description that I have to cheerlead them, I have to facilitate the process, or as Rajat said, lead end to end. But I wanna draw a distinction between when somebody says a title or a role versus a job. And the argument is the same as a soccer team or a football team, right? If you're on a soccer team and your team lost to the opponent, they scored five and you scored four goals. And the forwards come in and say, look, hey, we scored four goals. We did our job, right? The defenders or the goalie didn't do their job. So in that context, 
maybe their role is being a forward, their role is being a defender, their role is being a goal, but they only have one job. All of them have one job, and that job is to win the match. So in your work life, it's the same, like whatever your directional department goals are, that we have to launch products on time, your job is really only that. So high performance teams understand that it's not okay to say, I did this, X, Y, Z did not. It's not okay. It doesn't work like that. High performance teams don't do that. High performance teams understand that interdependence that if I'm done sooner, maybe I can help others on the team. Uh, that I'm looking out for what areas I can add value in, even though it's not in my direct control. And you can argue, hey, I don't have time to do my own job. How can I focus on others? And that's a valid argument, but we're not getting into that. That's for another day. But high performance team, if you remember this idea of a job versus a role, is the success of the department or the success of the team, not individual goal. And you'll hear more about that. So we're hitting some more responses here, deliver financial success for my business. So with that, let me move on because the topic today is creating and leading high performance team. We define the team, we define high performance and virtual team could be hybrid or complete that maybe you had some element of phone calls or video calls before, now it's 100% or maybe it's hybrid. Uh, so virtual teams are clearly teams that are either not meeting face to face at all, or they've started to meet a little bit more. The argument is it's not going away. Ford Motor Company has said till the end of the year, Google has said till the end of the year, a lot of other organizations uh, are saying, if you're not really, if you don't really have to be in the office, stay at home. So we're stuck with this. So how do we deal with that? What are some challenges? That's what we'll try to cover. And we'll introduce a framework that, um, that I became exposed to recently. So here's the annotate exercise. I'm questioning and there's a question for everybody on the line. Uh, before that, high performance team, do you think uh, Apollo 13, right? The mission to moon where they were supposed to land on the moon. Do you think that was high performance or not? Just say yes or no. And if you say whatever, it's a good answer. Apollo 13 um, had a catastrophe on the way to the moon. They never landed on the moon. So was that a high performance team? It was a famous Hollywood movie, if you've seen it. So a lot of people are saying yes. Tell me why do you think it's a high performance team? Because they didn't land on the moon. Don't know wasn't part of it. <laughs> Honest answer, yes. If you haven't seen the movie or don't know, we can't really judge. We can only estimate from what we see or hear about it. Um, why do you say it's a high performance team? Those that said it's a high performance team. Executed under pressure, yeah. I mean, so in real life, guys, that's gonna happen that you have a goal, you're moving towards it, something happens outside of your control. Maybe you didn't achieve your original goal, but your new goal now is, uh, you know, the mission control guy says, no American has died in space and they're sure not gonna die on my watch, right? So the new mission was bring everybody back safely. So in that regard, Rajat, you have a comment, go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to say the same thing. They were able to come back safely, so. Yeah, so in that regard, success is not just, oh, we have these brilliant metrics that we achieved, Senior leadership has to understand that the teams face a lot of uncertainty, global environment, which is what we are facing today. If we had certain goals to launch certain products, do certain things, how are you adapting in that situation? And how are leaders enabling their success in that regard? Uh, I thought that was a crucial point to get across that high performance team is adapting to what's thrown at you. So with that, let's move on to this chart here. Uh, again, bring out your annotate tool, put an X on where do you think virtual teams, creating a rewarding teamwork, is it easier or more challenging or about the same? Take the X mark so that we are all using the same. Go to annotate, use the stamp option and put the red X mark wherever you feel. So somebody's saying, okay, on the right hand side of about the same. Let's see other X's before we move on. Three, three X's all on the right hand side. Let's see a few more because we have 28 folks as I said on the line. So we should get at least Half, I think. Tress says everybody had a great sense of purpose. Everybody was rowing in the same direction, common goal, right? So Apollo 13 had a common goal. Um, yeah, great comments coming through. Keep them up, keep them coming. So we see four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One person is on the left, mostly are on the, almost at the mid mark on the right. There's a few on the left. 
So I wanna hear from those that are on the left. Uh, why do you think it's easier in a virtual environment making effective teamwork? Can you type in? Or if you wanna speak up, I can unmute you. I have to keep a check on the time. Yeah. You need to be really organized to get things done virtually. So there's some people arguing that, okay, maybe it's not all that bad. Um, you know, because maybe we're using online tools better, maybe because we're not wasting time in the face-to-face -face interaction. Um, after we virtual for a while, we get used to it. So that's a valid point. That challenge is a function of amount of exposure and experience. Gene has a great comment that maybe virtual was a novelty, but no longer it is. So it's no longer a challenge. Uh, it depends on the type of team or sector. Maybe if you're in IT, maybe it's easier. You don't want people to disturb you. Just know what needs to be done. You go out and do it. Great comments. Uh, less interference from outside group. <laughs> so uh, great comment that it's not all bad in some areas and some uh, manners, virtual can be better. But most of the people on this chat at least, and this is very typical of the responses we get, feel that it's more challenging. And if I put on the next screen, what are some reasons? I, I don't think these are uh, brilliant insights for anybody, but let's just hear them again as to why and what are the things that we as leader, we need to be more mindful of. Maybe we know it, but we kind of become immune to it. People can't see you. You can't see others. They can't see all of you. So the key part of the non-verbal interaction where words are maybe 10% or less, right? Tone and how you say it is another 20%. Body language is 40 to 50% of your message. So when you're online, if you, all of that is getting diluted. And as a leader, you have to understand that maybe people are not really getting the messages that are going out to them. And I'm really checking in with them to make sure they are on board or not. So even in face-to-face -face communication, what we tell our team is not completely understood. And in virtual, it only gets compounded. Uh, you're, you're not able to see uh, there's distractions, right? There's, there's messages that are being texting, your people are texting, they're eating, they're doing all kinds of things, your bandwidth issues. Certainly people, there's reports that there's something called Zoom fatigue, that your brain is seeing all these pictures on the screen, maybe people's faces that you're trying to take in too much. And it's literally a psychological phenomena that it's causing a fatigue. So again, maybe this is not new news for you, but if it is, or even if it is not, if it's a restatement, those are the reasons why we start to think differently as we go forward on this new normal. What are some of the things we can do to make our teams uh, less stressed and more effective? So on the next slide, some of the tips that, um, you know, keep it short, less is more because of all those reasons. There's distractions, there is uh, shorter attention spans, I had a leader, a senior divisional manager who kind of almost shamed the rest of us. Uh, and I didn't have my camera on because I had all these security concerns. This was at the start of the thing. And he said, you guys are still in your pajamas or what? And sure enough, our cameras came on. And I think it makes a big difference if you can request it in a manner that makes sense. Keeping a camera on takes you from a verbal communication to a much higher level of um, getting towards high performance. So again, maybe it's very common sense for most of you. It wasn't for me. I was not using camera at the start of this thing. Personalize the language between we and us and our, as opposed to this project or a project, keep them engaged. Signposting language. So I've seen evidence of this where you can say, okay, now that we're done with this, I'm gonna dive into this portion for the next five minutes. So you have to keep people's attention. You have to segment your meeting into smaller chunks and keep them involved. Otherwise it's very easy for them to drift away. So these are some common things. For the next 20 minutes I am going to, that's all I have on this topic. Now let's look at, on the next slide you will see, next such and such will cover this. In conclusion is very powerful. So people may be texting or doing whatever, but when you're ready to move from one section, all you have to say is, so in summary, and they'll look up, right? because they're like, okay, what did I miss? Uh, so some very common things. The tools that we're using today, again, maybe you use them all day long, maybe you don't. If you like any of these, use them because that's how you can engage the team and, and get more participation. Make sure you're in a quiet space, dedicated office. Um, 
There's somebody in the waiting room. Let me admit them. Uh, so the goals for today, again, we talked about having a framework. This is not my framework. Patrick Lencioni is a world famous consultant. It's his framework about the five key elements of effective teamwork. We'll, we'll share a little video. I'll give you some background around it. So I'm, I'm authorized to use this framework. Uh, I came, became aware of it maybe three, four years ago. This is his concept. Uh, he's used it for companies across the globe. I have used it in SAE. I've used it for some clients. We will not be getting through all of the five elements, but you'll get a feel for the trust portion of it. I'll give you an overview of what all elements are in brief passing and then deeper dive into trust. And so that, that'll be the framework. And then how it applies to virtual teams that if trust is necessary in general, uh, you know, it's, it's still required in virtual, how do we do more of that in a virtual environment? So that's the, the next few minutes where I would then walk you through a video. So it's about a three minute video. If you have issues with the um, jerkiness of the video or audio, please raise your hand and I'll share the link with you, right? That way you can watch it on your own screen and we can come back together as a group. So let me see how this pans out. It was okay the last time we tried it. Um, just a few more words on this topic that they have assessment. So you can take assessment as an individual or as a team. If you're a six people team, you wanna see how the team is doing on those five elements. It'll spit out a score. It'll say in this team, trust is low or conflict is low. People may disagree, but they don't bring it up. And then you can decide how to intervene in that area of weakness. You can retake the assessment and see how the team has grown. So that's really the framework for a team. And on an, indiv on an individual basis, it tells you what are your traits, natural strengths or challenges on each one of these elements. So very, very powerful tool that we will be skimming through all of the five and a little bit deep dive into the trust area. So let, with that, let me go to the video portion of it. Oh, we've been thrown on one team after another. Soccer teams, project teams, work teams, you name it. And even though we have lots of experience being on teams, the only advice we've ever been given about how to be a good teammate is to play nice and everything will work out. But what if it doesn't? What if people spend more time politicking and posturing? What if people can't agree on which direction to take so they go nowhere? What if everyone is just looking out for themselves? Turns out there's more to good teamwork than just playing nice. That's where the five behaviors of a cohesive team comes in. Based on Patrick Lincioni's New York Times best-selling book, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team, this simple but powerful model consists of five behaviors that people can master to become a better teammate and to start building stronger teams. Here's Patrick to explain those behaviors. There are five behaviors that all teams have to master to become true functional teams. The first is trust. Team members have to trust one another, which means they're vulnerable with one another. Vulnerability, which I think is one of the most important characteristics any human being can embrace in life, is nothing but admitting who you are as a person. It means they're capable of being completely honest and human with one another. That's important because it enables them to embrace the second behavior, which is conflict. Yes, conflict. When people are vulnerable and trustworthy with one another, they'll engage in conflict without fear. They'll debate issues and they'll be totally upfront with one another. As a result of that, they'll be able to embrace the third behavior, which is commitment. They'll commit actively to decisions and they'll leave the room on the same page, totally committed to follow through on what they've agreed to. That commitment will give them the courage to hold each other accountable, knowing that they're doing nothing but reminding each other about what they've intended to do from the beginning. And that accountability will ensure that they get results, that they're focused on the collective results of the team and not their individual needs. So it starts with trust, it goes to conflict, commitment, accountability, and ultimately, results. That's it. Now, ironically, it's not that complicated to build a team. It's pretty simple in theory, but it is hard because it requires a lot of work over time and a lot of courage, but it's worth it because the benefits of a great team are truly extraordinary. And it all starts with you. Teams are made up of individuals after all, and every individual has a part to play in making them stronger and more cohesive. 
It's how we get back to those teams that were fun and fulfilling and we couldn't wait to be a part of. We have different takes on teamwork. You ask 10 different people, you might get 20 opinions on teamwork. But usually people like simplicity and I like the framework. This is not by any means all inclusive that these are the only things that work for a high performance team. Uh, today, as I said, our focus will only be trust. So let me walk through some of the key things that you might have hear, heard Patrick talk about. That trust is not the trust that I know Atul will be in the office at 8 a.m., that he has the competency to get the job done. Trust is to say, in our team, are people able to admit mistakes? When something goes wrong, do they try to hide it or blame others? Or do they raise their hand and say, look, I goofed up. And these are not, maybe not, you know, we're not saying repeat mistakes or same mistake again and again or catastrophic mistakes. If it's an honest mistake, it's necessary for innovation and for doing a good job. Anybody who has ever worked will make a mistake. So are we creating a safe environment where people can be vulnerable in that regard? The second idea is that when you don't know something, can you say, I don't know? In today's environment, if your team asks you, when are we getting our salary cuts reinstated or uh, you know, when are these furloughs going to end or what is the vision for the next six months? And if you don't have an answer, the worst thing you can do is avoid that topic because it lingers on, it festers and the anxiety is building up. So we're not saying make false promises, but the idea is acknowledge that you don't know, show that vulnerability and handle that. Uh, the idea of conflict is that people are just nodding their head but disagreeing because they don't want to ruffle the feathers. We don't want teams like that where the meetings are quiet, nobody says anything. We want conflict about products and processes and things. We don't want toxic name calling or character assassinations or you know personality conflict. Commitment is the idea that it's not consensus, that people may not have 100% agreement, but they're committed. What does that mean? That if I propose something and five other people are saying something else, then my voice is heard. There is a forum where they're seeking input, they discuss things, they explain why they are proceeding a certain way or thinking to, what are some things that may be not so valid about my opinion. Maybe they take some elements my, of my suggestion. They, they hear me out. So I have the buy-in and commitment when that happens. So in a virtual team, how does it happen less or more because either we are not thinking of that or not doing enough of that. Again, we're not focusing on it, but that's the gist that commitment is not consensus. Commitment is listening to everybody, discussing as a team, and at the end of it, you can agree or you can disagree, but you must commit that this is our goal. We said teams have common goals. Um, so that's the idea of commitment. Accountability again is not that I hold myself accountable. It's the idea that I hold my teammates accountable. It's a little bit of a constructive feedback that if somebody said in a meeting, Yes, we're nodding our head, we'll do it. We're all on board. And people go out and say, oh, what a baloney, you know, this is such a bad idea. You, you should be able to say, you know, maybe that meeting was a good place to mention that concern. Do, you, do we need to reconvene? Because clearly you're not convinced. But if I'm saying that's not my job, it's the manager's job, that's not a high performance team. That it's everybody on the team's job to intervene in situations like that and make sure teammates are accountable. Peer-to-peer -peer accountability is what we're talking about. And results, again, is not individual selfish results that Atul Kalia should look like a hero and get a promotion or do well. We're not talking about those results. The team results that we are incentivizing them for collaboration. Organizations reward individuals. Performance reviews are for individuals. And then we seek teamwork. How is that going to happen, right? So are our, our metrics aligned with that where there's an element of collaboration and some element of teamwork that they are rewarded on so that results uh, of the team can be the focus. That was my quick take on this aspect of it. As I said, we'll get into the results of the trust part. Other comments on the video or the framework? The risk would be that the team becomes the goal. Okay, I didn't quite understand, but maybe we need more explanation from Jean. Keep going, says Claudia. Great so far, says Jenna. Okay, so let's go. And uh, maybe Jean can add in towards the q and I would love to hear, Jean, your thoughts on the comment that you just made. 
moving on, here's a question for you. As you think of these think things, you know, trusting, being vulnerable, showing mistakes or admitting you don't know, raising conflict, creating conflict, not being perturbed by conflict, committing to a goal, holding others accountable, team goals versus individual goals. Which one comes most natural to you if you have to pick one? So what we're gonna do next is a poll and I will share the results with you. So pretty soon on your screen should be a poll. Just make your selection. I'll leave it on for maybe 10, 15 seconds. So the question is, let's not assume things blindly, right? Because we're smart people. And let's think about this framework. What, what does the team think comes naturally to us? And then how to do, uh, so somebody says, I can't see the poll, maybe they're on the phone, but they're saying my vote would be results. So we have two votes so far for results, but counting Tress's vote on the chat box, that's three for results. So we have 20 and it's not moving anymore. I'm going to end the poll right here and I'm going to share the results with you. So you should see on your screen how this audience has polled. Are you able to see my results? So commitment, and this is not a surprise that most people um, are able to commit. Uh, second is a tie between trust and accountability. Conflict is low, that we either avoid conflict, don't wanna create it or not comfortable with it if somebody else raises it. Results, you know, team versus my own. Maybe my, my organization doesn't have the right metrics. So it's very hard for me to do the team goals. Accountability part is a surprise for me. Most people struggle with that because it's really literally reaching out to your teammate and telling them what they did wrong. But this group apparently feels uh, comfortable with that, which is a good thing. Usually most people struggle with that and trust uh, people feel that I can admit mistakes. So that's, that's a good thing. Conflict and results are lower. So I'm going to stop sharing the results and I'm going to move away from this slide. Here's another poll that uh, this is the report that you would get if you were to take a personal development report. It'll kind of tell you based on your DISC profile, which is a behavioral profile, how you do on these traits and what are some avenues for you to be a better team player. Uh, again, I'm just showing it for reference. Let me move on to the next slide. Trust in a virtual team environment. Uh, these are some things that we've talked about, being vulnerable. My question is, how do you reconcile? As a leader, you have to be strong. Things are bad right now. How can I be vulnerable and admit my weakness? Isn't that bad for the team? Won't they say I'm a weak leader? What do you say? Type in your responses, I would love to hear. Why do you think vulnerability is a good idea? Or if you disagree, tell me that no, this is terrible idea that I don't wanna be weak, I want a strong leader who knows everything and who doesn't make mistakes. Or who doesn't, who doesn't say, hey, I'm concerned about this current climate of the virtual teams with the way things are going. They seem to be improving. The crisis has passed us. Things are opening up, but we're kind of worried about maybe is there gonna be a second wave, how the economy is gonna take off. Transparency brings trust in teams. Within reason, I don't like the vulnerable term. Fair enough. So everything's balanced. So you know you can't be overly vulnerable and all the time you are wishy-washy or uncertain. But my question is, how do you reconcile with this? So I'm gonna leave you with that question. I don't have all the answers, but my challenge to you is, we're not going to adopt everything and blindly that think about it. Why does it make sense for you? And experiment with it and see if the results are better because of you doing it okay so somebody else said being vulnerable is being comfortable with yourself to a certain extent it's good so those are all valid comments and questions that if you like the concept of vulnerability admitting mistakes and saying when you don't know it saying you don't know it but that doesn't mean you have to appear weak one classic example in the leadership in the world today i think most people have cited most business schools and case studies have cited as the prime minister of New Zealand, right? So she has said on multiple occasions, the uncertainty that she faced herself, but she has put on a very humane side of her personal life, her struggles, and at the same time, firmly guided the country. So I think when we talk about the balance between being vulnerable and being strong, they are not at the mercy of each other. It doesn't mean that just because you're showing vulnerability, you are any less of a leader or any stronger of a leader. So somebody said, vulnerability is equal to honesty is equal to trust. And it starts with the leader, it starts with you wherever appropriate. So if you haven't addressed your team yet, maybe it's too late, maybe it's not. You know, you can say things are improving, 
why do I even have to broach the topic and you know re scratch the wounds that are trying to heal? Um, that's a question only you can answer. I know as late as yesterday, as recent as yesterday, somebody on my team expressed their concern. One of the elderly person, his mother-in-law had a fall from the stair, broke her arm in two places. So he's up all night, they're having to go to the hospital. He himself is advanced age. Um, so people still have concerns. They have to go into this scenario. Even in normal scenarios, breaking an arm is tough. And here we are, people are dealing with these things. You might be dealing with these things. So if we, if we ignore the elephant in the room versus we bring it up once, see how that goes and maybe do it occasionally, that's the challenge I'm posing to you. Do you think that's a good idea? Would you be willing to do that? We're gonna experiment with that today. Here's another poll. Um, so I want you to again, answer this poll that it's gonna come up on your screen that if a team member shared their challenges, how would you think of them or your relationship. So you have that poll on your screen. Let's hear everybody chime in. If somebody shared their challenges, something that's bugging them, how do you think it'll impact your opinion of them? I have one, and I'm going to share the results. So this is what our group thinks. A significant majority thinks it would improve our relationship. Uh, another strong amount feels it would you would trust them more because of it about 22% feel that it'll have little or no impact on your opinion. And then nobody thinks that would be, you would think less of them for opening up. Um, so you saw those results. And here's another question then that if I flip that question, right? And I'm asking you, you know, if like the I here is you, if you shared your current challenges, what do you think would happen? We asked the first question that if somebody shared what would happen and almost nobody said that they would think less, that you would think less of your colleague. But here there's at least a few, some percentage that feel that your colleague would think less of you if you shared your challenges or stressors. I think the predominant trait is still the same that relationship would increase, trust would improve, maybe a little lesser number feel that there would be no impact on the trust level. Uh, but at least a few popped up that felt, eh, this may not be such a good idea because they may judge me, I will look bad. And here the barrier to vulnerability is of course that we are, we are fearful of being judged and hence unable to open. And it had a negative impact on virtual teamwork where all of us are carrying our own baggages. We are not having those informal conversations. As a leader, then your job is that some people may be more trusting in virtual environment because they really push to the limit, they need help. Right? They're to the point where they would appreciate the support. And yet there are some that would be pushed the other way because they are stressed, but they're like closing in, right? They're not gonna open up. And as a leader, you have to recognize where is the need of my team? Who needs what? And if somebody is closed up, it doesn't mean everything's okay, right? So I'm not gonna directly offer help, but at least I need to be aware and ask and seek. No news does not mean good news. So if I'm not doing that part of, seeking out and reaching out and hearing those things, I may be um, missing the boat there. So the next survey um, is here. What is the most important factor that makes it easier to be vulnerable with your teammates? If you click on, put an X, go to annotate or view annotate from your Zoom toolbox, pick the stamp option and put an X on whichever jives with you. If it's other, you can type in your response there or you can type it in the chat box. More weightage on team members showing empathy and vulnerability, but certainly getting to know teammates is up there. When this was asked of thousands of people, getting to know teammates came out as the stronger, strongest factor that uh, psychology reports have shown that something as simple as the same first name can psychologically tune in and create the trust with that person. I know it sounds crazy, but then similarity, same town, like the same sports team, you know, whatever you know about them that's common, we like what is familiar to us. So if we're not doing that in, and more in the virtual environment, we're kind of missing out on the informal interaction that used to happen. And we have to take pause and time to do more of that. So what are some avenues by which we can do that? That's the focus of this, the rest of the 30 minutes or so we've covered what team means, what high performance team means, what the five behavior framework is. We've talked about trust and we're saying that if trust, a key part of that is knowing your teammates, 
then how do you do more of that in the virtual that maybe it's fallen by the wayside because the more informal avenues of running into them on a hallway or a casual conversation has gone away. And we understand that um, the idea of um, forcing this discussion, that's not about a project or a task, but it's just a general conversation. Somebody has to do it. So I want you to grapple with that and see if you reconcile with that or if you think that's too theoretical, won't work. We hear stories from leaders that have done it. They've been pleasantly surprised that even now when they do it, it's like teams are craving for it. So you set aside some time and invariably it goes overboard because people have so much to say. Uh, they want somebody to listen. They, just the act of somebody listening is like a pressure relief for them. Um, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna actually practice it because we can talk about it till I'm blue in the face or I can let you experience it. There's 24 of us. We're gonna create six breakout rooms. So when I trigger this, you'll automatically be taken to a breakout room. Assign somebody as a timekeeper who makes sure that you can finish this in 15 minutes. That's the time you'll have. Uh, when there's two minutes to go, you'll see a timer and that'll bring you back. Um, the questions that you should think about discussing are gonna be on the screen. You don't have to talk about all of them. You can talk about some of them or a few of them. It's okay to talk about none of them either if you, if you, if you go that route. But it's a breakout session where we're experiencing what we just discussed that if you think about the current crisis started in March, looked like far, far away, then it came upon us. How did that impact you? Uh, as you look forward, what are your concerns? What are your hopes? So these are the questions. What is the impact so far? Personal, you can talk. Family, you can talk. Professionally, your team. Coming months, you can talk. You know, how's the economy going to open? And I can start, I can share that when it was happening in China, this was like most people, a far away thing. You know, you know, you shame on me that I never realized the gravity of it when it doesn't hit you, you don't understand it. Um, but in March, it just, some of the most fearful days, right? So I remember somebody in the family having some symptoms and you kind of go to curbside check-in. That whole experience is traumatic. Um, my daughter is in first year college. She had to vacate the dorm because they were giving out some refunds in early April. So even in early April, going to her dorm to clear out her stuff is like you're going to a war, right? You don't know what this thing is. From a professional level, uh, clients have you know different challenges. They have salary reductions. So as a consultant, you're pitching in there as well. Nobody knows what's going to happen in the economy. Stock market surprisingly is doing well, but there's concerns. My parents, my dad is no more. He passed away two years ago, but my mom is elder. I worry about her. So those are all the things that kind of weigh on you, even though you're going through day-to-day -day stuff. And what helped me was kind of having these conversations with my people, the group that, that is support, sort of my support group, people that I interact with, not just as mentors. I have mentors. I have other people that I coach. Just asking them questions, sharing these things with them. Just doing that helped me. Uh, so that's my story. And I, I want you to take that as a cue when you go into your breakout room, you'll have 15 minutes, four people per room. Let's say it's 21 now, so maybe still five rooms. Are we good with that? I mean, I'll go ahead and start quickly. The impact for me has basically been one of more social interaction. I guess the idea of being um, non-face-to-face -face oriented and very limited social interplay has been the big issue. Luckily, it's been no major issues beyond that. Yeah, this is Harsha. So I'm, uh, I'm in the automotive industry and uh, uh, focusing mainly on manufacturing and testing. And, and obviously, in the manufacturing area, it's, it's impacted us a lot. You know, factory shut down, production uh, shut down, and uh, it, it's, uh, you know, team members uh, being affected. <laughs> So it's been a it's been a slow recovery uh, for us. I mean, we've, we've never had to shut down a factory for for this long of a period, and uh, it's, it's affected the entire ecosystem for for us. And also in terms of vehicle testing, uh, right? So uh, just having two people in a vehicle test, I mean that that was a given for us in the past. Now we've got to put all these plexiglass and, and you know, take care of, of all those kind of things. So it's uh, Sort of affected us, but uh, on the other hand, uh, 
uh, try to figure out. I agree. I don't know what what your take is on this whole thing or how the next few months will pan out. Mm -hmm. Well, um, pers per personally, I don't have much fear. Um, you know, I'm taking care of myself and and I'm trying to you know socially distance and stay home most of the time and work from home 24/7. But I have an elderly mom, she's 83 years old and she lives with us. She moved to this country about 13, 12, 13 years ago and she lives with us. And she is not in good health and she is very immunocompromised. And so that um, really concerns me because I'm her main caregiver. Mm -hmm. um, so that's on my mind. And then I ha we have two children, my husband and I, and, and they're older and they, you know, one is 29, one is 26 almost. and they live one lives in new orleans which mm -hmm. is like a hot really big hot spot right now mm -hmm. and then one in, in chicago one is in chicago so you know they're not kids and chicks anymore but you're a mother you always yeah. you know even if i'm if they're 80 years old i'll still be thinking about them as my yeah. children and whether or not they're going to make good decisions for them absolutely absolutely thank you for sharing that no it's been crazy and i hope this was the peak of it that there is no more yeah. second story to it so these are the questions i don't know how much or what topics you were able to cover the idea being if one of the traits of high performance teams and certainly in the virtual world is trust how do we try to inculcate that maybe there's some special efforts we have to make and special things we have to go through because it's lesser interactions with those on our team um, so if you have any things you want to share with the rest of us anything on how that breakout session went. Jean, I know you had some other comments. If you would like to chime in, would love to hear your thoughts. Well, if you're talking about the team becoming a goal, the, uh, the idea there is that all of a sudden the team is more interested in sustaining itself rather than performing the mission. Uh, the team, been on teams that came close to doing that, but um, Fortunately, strong management says, no, you will not continue on a team. We'll bust this one up and start you on another one. And that's, that, and that's fine, but you know, when the team becomes the end result for the team, then they lose sight of the mission and it's more of a social gathering. Brilliant point, brilliant point that they become somewhat of a, they have this exclusive mindset that you know, we are either special or you know, we need to continue on beyond the, whatever the charter of the team was. Yep. So, so it's a very the, interesting point. The project management, technology or the body of knowledge has a word for that. I just don't remember what it was. Thank you for sharing that. Welcome. So we're back in the main room. Uh, we are asking you, you were in the breakout session and we said the foundation is that in a virtual environment, maybe it's not as easy to have these kind of conversations. So how do we force it with our team? And before we do that, let's experience it ourselves. How was this experience? Or maybe you can say, have you done this with your teams? Have you seen others do it? Anything that comes in your mind, go ahead and chime in. Try it with your team to maybe think about how you would approach this with your team. So Paul says interesting experiences. I heard a little bit of their conversation. I was trying to go through different rooms. So, so really, what, when you think of your own team or your work environment, do you see how you may want to bring some of these pieces in? Or are you already doing it? You know, in, in the business as usual, staying on projects and work related tasks versus making time for such informal conversations in the virtual world because they don't happen by the water cooler or walking down the hallway. Uh, Have you seen others do it? Have you done it? Or would you be looking to do so, it? What are your thoughts? Sure, sure. So actually we, uh, we try to do once a week or periodically uh, what we call as like virtual office hours. So we try to have the team or you know, multiple teams uh, try to get together online, usually on a Friday, Friday evening, Friday afternoon, Friday evening. And uh, it's like an hour or so. And uh, it's not strictly technical or, or project related, but it's more, you know, as I said, this water cooler kind of uh, chat. Uh, some people can bring up uh, concerns related to work, but some of them talk about what they're doing in the weekend, you know, how their kids are doing or, uh, what issues they're having with, you know, I don't know, grocery or whatever. So I think uh, I found it very interesting, especially in the beginning, because uh, I've, I've got a few uh, team members who 
got uh, kids, you know, they, they had kids uh, during the month of uh, February, March. And uh, interestingly, they, they had a tough time getting diapers, which, uh, which we always take for granted. Mm -hmm. So in these, uh, in these meetings, uh, you know, usually you, you do it from the one or two big retailers that we normally do, but, uh, you know, they were all sold out. And so in these meetings, somebody said, hey, you should try this website, or hey, you should you know, go, go to this store, or you do okay. this, and, and they have a limited, uh, you know, stock of it. And so I, I, I really found that uh, those kind of informal conversations were very helpful to solve simple, but very sort of basic and essential needs of, of the people. So we, we still do that. Uh, all the things are, are gotten a lot better now. Yeah. But uh, to, to answer your question, yeah, the, the, we, we, we try to engage in those kind of uh, office hours uh, kind of things. Thank you for sharing that. Very insightful. So if you're doing it, others on the call, obviously see how you can taper it now towards maybe return to work or the next six months. And maybe the worst is behind us and maybe it's not. We don't know. But some of the traumatic experiences that people have felt, you know, personally, I know of a gentleman who lost somebody, not because of the, this crisis, but just something different. And his dad was in Canada, he's in the US and Michigan, he was not able to go. So that in of itself, you know, we discovered in an informal conversation. And if we, if we did not, how do we know what he's going through, right? It's pretty traumatic to not go to the funeral of your dad. And he's not alone. I think a lot of people had that same trauma. And those things are not going away in a month, two months, three months, though they, those people are carrying it with them. So you can say, well, we are professionals. We're here to do a job. We're not counselors. It's not my job or it's, this is too fuzzy. Or is it? Uh, I don't know what is right and wrong. I'm posing the question and only you can answer that, that when we talk of virtual teams and high performance teams and trust, people remember how you treated them in that moment of darkness. Because believe me, they have that moment of darkness. Somebody's mother-in-law fell from the stairs, broke her arm, other losses. So if as a leader, I'm oblivious to it, there is no way I can dream of a high performance team, perhaps. That's my argument. Uh, this is not a gospel, not a golden rule. And you have to discover on your own. Try it if you haven't tried it, see how it works. Simon says they have a weekly 30 minute coffee break chat on MS Teams. This works well. So one challenge for you is if you're not doing it, consider an activity like this with your team reports or with your team. Uh, if you're not leading a team, maybe suggest it to somebody. Uh, some of the topics could be that there are things going on that financial heartburn that they've seen. Uh, this is at Rajat's suggestion. Uh, again, some of these might be trivial for you. One-on-one -on -one informal conversations that if you're only meeting in these big team meetings or project meetings, uh, we are missing the point that it takes that extra effort time to create informal conversations via phone calls. Uh, not just coffee, virtual coffee session, but sometimes could be one-on-one. -on -one. Some of the online tools, if you're seeing them for first time, they could be useful. Maybe you have a bigger group, you can break into smaller groups, you can annotate, engage them, right? High performance team is engaged. If you're not using those tools, maybe some of them are useful for you. Um, virtual happy hour or lunch, virtual stand-up meeting. So that's more work related, but it could be a daily stand-up call that's tied into work. Celebrations of birthdays and anniversaries. Tell them to keep the camera on. Again, the example I gave, it worked for me. I was oblivious to the fact that it was leaving a negative impression. Now I keep it on in every meeting. This is the leader suggested it. I don't know what your thoughts are that they work together with cameras on. So it's not a meeting, but it's like you've been in an office, everybody's in the cubicles. So maybe it's a foreign concept and sounds scary because other things are going on that you don't wanna be on the camera, but this is what they're doing. They're actually on camera working together. Listen and observe, just listening, observing, remembering the challenges, you're gonna build a high performance team. Five behaviors of a cohesive team. If you would like to see how the assessment is for your team, you can certainly reach out, let me know. I can fill you in on how to proceed on that action that how individuals do well and how teams do well by taking that assessment. Somebody said Netflix has a party option where you can all watch a movie together. So again, maybe it's not for everybody, but some people are doing that. Maybe you say, look, I've had enough of you. I don't wanna see more of you even during a movie watching, I want my alone time. And that's okay too, we're not judging. Follow-up sessions, we only cover trust. We can get into conflict and what that means in virtual world and other aspects of this five behavior model. If you're interested in that, simply reach out to me. Ask your team, 
what are the three important things you're doing next week, right? On a one-on-one -on -one or in a team meeting. How can I help? Where are you stuck? What do you need from me? Simple questions. And as I said, number one team, be self-aware of yourself and also others. So instead of doing, which is great, we have to execute, bring results, but just being in the moment and observing and realizing. So what will you start doing today? Not even tomorrow, today. What will you change or do from the session that you've heard? Please type in the chat box, let's hear them. Listen better, Paul says. Using breakout Zoom to take a break. Yeah, if it's a bigger group, maybe people want that breakout room. You can say, okay, we're gonna discuss this, go to breakout rooms, come together, and we'll share brainstorming ideas. Maintain a questioning attitude, Pedro says. Try to be more self-aware, Simon says. What else? We're at the 3.30 mark almost, so we're almost done. I appreciate the interactive tools used with Zoom and hope to use them in future. Organize a virtual TGIF, Jenna says. Listen more, turn off distractions, connect with teammates if possible using online games, develop trust, hang out virtually more often, Rajat. Would like to implement breakout room concept in our team. Awesome. I wanna hear from you guys. This should not end here. Uh, if I get an email from you, something from you to tell me how it went, that will make my day. You can always call me, Q&A will do later on. Next week, same time, 2 p.m., we have Harsha who was on the call today. Thank you, Harsha, for joining. We'll have a Q&A with him, very informal session. He's a VP at Hitachi of R&D. So his take on the how things are rolling out, uh, his take on leadership, what he would suggest, you know, existing leaders, emerging leaders, all of that. Um, Here's my contact info. You can connect with me on LinkedIn. You have my Twitter, email, phone. And remember, join ASEM. It's a good organization. If you're not a part of it, Raj, a um, few others that I know that I sent you the email about, do look at ASEM, what they have to offer. You won't, you won't regret it. Yeah, uh, this is Saurav here. I have a question for you from uh, one Go of ahead, the... Sir. So uh, you mentioned that uh, in case uh, there's a meeting going on and uh, one of the teammates has a question. So should a teammate, given that the question is logical, uh, go to his manager to first see what his manager's input is or uh, just ask the question in the meeting itself right away? So are you talking about the commitment portion that if they disagree with something and have a question? Yes, sir. Yeah. Great point. I mean, it depends on the context. Maybe offline, you can give me more details that you don't want to sound like there's not alignment, right? If it's a bigger group, multidisciplinary team, um, you always want to be aligned. You never want to surprise your boss. But hopefully you have an organization where that open discussion is allowed. Many times it's not allowed. Believe it or not, people take offense to it. People say you're disjointed, that your boss said, okay, why are you raising a concern? It depends on the context. I would say, in a well-mature, well-led organization, anybody should be able to say anything without being judged or looked like a fool. So I, it's hard for me to say what is the right approach in this case. I would say, give me more context either now or later on and we can, we can talk about it. I would always take the plunge, that's just me. I don't care if somebody judges me or I, I'm a, gonna ruffle the feathers. That's my take, but I won't suggest it to you. I don't want you to get into trouble. So let's talk more. Okay, sounds good, sounds good, definitely. Thank you for your answer. Yeah. Other questions? Great question, by the way, that if you're talking about commitment, somebody's going down a path, we don't agree, should I just stay quiet, ask the question, go to my boss, ask him, then ask it later on? I try to create those conflicts. In a meeting, I will ask, hey, the, the divisional general manager is telling us this, what is your take? Do you agree with that? What are your thoughts? I want him, I want them to air that out. Um, in some organizations I've seen where people are told, do not speak up if your boss's boss is there. Believe it or not, it happens. More hierarchical cultures, even countries see some of that. So you have to, there's not a cookie cutter answer to this question. It's a great question, by the way. Maybe it comes with some experience. So the question is, will next week's session be posted to the website? Yes, uh, Angie has the details. Uh, so hopefully uh, she'll post them soon and you'll be able to sign up. Same time, 2 p.m. next Thursday, we'll have the casual Q&A with Harsha. Other questions, guys? 
uh, actually again i do have a question but it's not necessarily related uh, so if you are uh, open to that i can ask all questions are welcome go for it okay so uh, a lot of my friends work in it and i've seen a lot of them uh, getting burnt out just because of uh, the amount of work they have to do so teams at times uh, if there is uh, like multiple priorities set by multiple people then uh, one uh, deliverables need to get completed so people just keep on working and uh, because there is no way to uh, vent stuff out like how how do you deal with that situation i know you gave uh, you already mentioned that uh, the breakout room is a good option but then uh, if that something that your company is not doing then what's the best way forward good question so let me rephrase it so make sure i understand it that a lot of your friends are in the it domain and what you're observing is a lot of burnout because there's multiple priorities deliverables are not changing maybe resources are less deadlines are still the same in light of all of their personal concerns or work related concerns the work is not getting less if anything it's more uh, so how do they discuss that vent that how do they overcome that challenge is that your question yes yes yeah um, i will get into that before i get into that anybody on the line has any thoughts on it can before i say I, yeah go ahead jana um so we're assuming that you are the that the individual who is responding is the leader of the group, right? Uh, either legitimate or... Are you? So, Saurabh, are you in the lead? Are you are you not even? You're talking about your friends. No, no, no. I'm, I'm actually talking about my friends. I'm not uh, their leader or in their team. Or are they the uh, leaders or they are the, like, the software people or, like, they're not leading the team? Yes, yes. So, uh, the friend I'm talking about, he's a data scientist and uh, that's, that's uh, who I observed this with. So he's not leading the team though, he's a data scientist. Yes, yes, he's a team okay. member. So Jenna, the, the person is a part of the team, organization does not have this kind of informal get together. Mm -hmm. There's burnout amongst the people that are technical. So, so that's the question. I would, I would just organize something on my own. I mean, I would suggest to this person to organize something. You don't have to have legitimate power given to you by the organization. You can be a leader. Oh and lead a group of individuals for the common goal. And in this case, the common goal would be stress relief. And so, you know, just suggest something. And if people are as stressed as you make them out to be, they will join and they will follow and you will have venting sessions. Not to put the organization down or to, to be negative, but to just, like you said, beginning, you know, building trust and, and sharing those vulnerabilities and, and just to hear out uh, from everybody else that we're all in the same boat, that it's not just me, it's everyone that is being effect, affected by it. I love it, love it, brilliant answer. So Saurabh, the key is that you are not gonna be empowered by anybody, right? Leaders have to grab that. And in fact, maybe some of your seniors are looking for that. So I'm not talking you, maybe your friend, that this sense of being a victim, that, oh, organization is not doing anything. It applies to every facet of the job, whether it's training or a tool. I've seen people where, you know, Slack maybe is not adopted by their team. Now Slack is common now, but six years ago when it first came out, big organizations had IT barriers and whatever you had to go through. Teams started doing it informally and they benefited from it. And then it became a big, bigger adoption. So that's how change begins. Change can be top down, hierarchical driven that, hey, we shall do this, or it can be pockets of excellence where somebody did something and good results are coming out and others go, hey, what are those guys doing that's working so well? Let's adopt it. So that's what Jenna is saying that, you know, he doesn't have to make it a big deal. He doesn't have to make a big announcement. He doesn't have to do anything. Just call a WhatsApp group or some chatting group, say, hey, let's talk about it on this day or set up a meeting. No hoopla, just get it done in a small informal way without waiting for approval. Now, still just a little bit be careful that you're not stepping on people's toes. Sometimes HR can be territorial or manager can feel, oh, why are you doing this? And nobody told me. You have to think through those and we can talk offline. But in general, you are empowered. Things that are benign, that are not hurting the organization, are helping with the stress. And in fact, the team is better off and delivering more. 
they'll go, man, this person's team is delivering consistently. Others are not. What are they doing that we need to adopt? Does that make sense? Yes, yes, definitely. Those approaches are actually uh, pretty good. I hadn't thought that uh, proactively doing this uh, would be such a good option. Yeah, don't just make it a big deal that, oh, we're going to do yeah. this, or big announcements or anything. Virtual, yeah, like I said, a virtual TGIF. You know, yeah. thank God it's Friday. You know, no one, the HR cannot tell you that you cannot meet yeah. all your friends virtually at 5 p.m. on a Friday. Exactly. And you have your beer and your wine and you sit across like we are and, <laughs> and you do it. <laughs> great, great point, Jenna. Thank you so much. Yeah, so if you're not doing it in work hours, like, I mean, I'm not saying drinking in work hours, but even non-work related talk in work hours, somebody could get. But what Jenna is saying is, no, nothing's stopping you, do it at 5 p.m. So you can say, yeah, nobody's stopping me, but that's taking time from me. And my argument is, yeah, it is, but it's gonna help you long-term that the productivity will go up. You'll spend some time, but it will increase the productivity. That's the argument. Great mm -hmm. question. So with that, I would like to thank you. You were a good audience. You kind of moved around, raised your hand, typed in, you made you a whole bunch of things. So thank you for bearing with me. Hopefully you found it useful. And as I said at the outset, hopefully you took at least one thing, maybe more, but at least one thing. And if not, you at least reinforced something that was already known and you sort of are going to stop. <music>